in section one of the introduction that you called speculative strategy that you has uh, given the characteristics that uh, define or the traits that characterize uh, truths, the absolute, eternal, uh, generic, and obje uh, or objective or um, universal, and at the same time, they're produced in a determinant world, localized in a determinant world, uh, apprehended in a determinant world. So that's his idea of truth. After that, in the second part of um, this first section, he has given us a genealogy of his own um, not coming to this idea of truth that is a little um, left in obscurity. The conversion between theory of the subject, which revives in a new form the subject, and uh, being an event which revives the subject and truths in relation to uh, the um, multiple without one and the infinity of infinities, which had a negative connotation in theory of the subject, that um, transition is uh, not really um, uh, discussed or, or clarified, uh, neither in, in this book with its little genealogy, uh, nor anywhere else as far as I know. So he's given a genealogy as well, uh, including um, the major influences um, leading up to theory of the subject, the, um, uh, the traps to avoid, and um, one of the traps, sort of the ultimate trap, is um, exemplified by uh, Lyotard, who, um, it is true, put forward the concept uh, of the authority of the infinite. So he fought the um, ideology of finitude at the prescriptive level, but um, left the ontological level um, to the sciences. And that meant that um, if the sciences found some sort of infinity, it would still be an infinity that is just the um, weak uh, stretching and prolongation of uh, the finite, as in the theories of um, complexification that uh, Lyotard talks about and says that whatever they are, whatever conclusions they come to, and whatever practical conclusions they come to in terms of leaving the earth and complexing, complexifying ourselves into space, that's not enough. We need something else, we need something infinite, and that's um, uh, the infinite prescription. And at the same time, Badiou uh, subscribes to the idea of the authority of the infinite. He subscribes to the idea that uh, truths as present localized produced in a determinate world are um, witnesses, they bear witness to the infinite. So what's stopping Lyotard? Or what's wrong? We've got uh, this first approximation. A second um, point of analysis of the problem with uh, Lyotard is this very notion of the different or different itself, which is uh, sort of a dummy concept, a stand-in concept 
for what uh, Badu is going to call the infinity of infinities, the higher and higher um, infinities. So uh, the fully developed um, concept of the of the multiple has these infinities in it, and that's a concept um, that was unavailable to Lyotard. So I think this is um, of more general import. I think uh, here um, Badiou and Laruelle agree in criticizing uh, what Laruelle calls the philosophies of difference. So uh, difference, which was wi widely touted as um, a, a radical revolutionary concept in the uh, late 60s and early 70s became a new halting point for um, the work of confronting the infinite uh, capacities of the multiple. So uh, Larowell rejects all the philo philosophies of difference because um, they're all relative, so they're all on the plane of uh, relativism or the relativist plane. Badiou rejects them for the same reason. They are all relative, these philosophies of difference. They can't get to the absolute. And um, uh, Badiou characterizes this um, relativist plane of differences as the plane of finitude or of weak um, infinity, uh, the thinly stretched finite. So that's um, a point of agreement with Lowell, and it's a point of uh, investigation for reading other philosophers and seeing uh, it's a grid of, uh, of reading. So reading um, Lyotard, you can see this point where Lyotard was going into the radical thought of multiplicities and intensities. And at a certain moment, it seems he was um, impressed by the argument that, le that led to extreme relativism and so could not um, uh, exclude Nazism, Nazism, for example, and his conclusion was that the multiple was not that the multiple is even um, more infinite than we thought, and there's a room for finding the absolute in that sort of um, uh, infinity of infinities. His conclusion was the multiple um, is not enough, and we need um, infinity, and where we find that is in um, the prescriptive uh, language game. So from uh, Badiou's point of view, that's a cop-out, that's uh, an ontological cop-out, so it's um, uh, uh, convergent with uh, this sort of um, reactive uh, retreat into the artistic procedure with the theory of the sublime and into the um, uh, what is ultimately uh, um, a form of um, religious procedure in the even without uh, transcendence but in the infinity of the uh, ethical prescription so We've got all that out of the idea of um, a relation between uh, truths and um, infinities. But our title is uh, The Imminence of Truths. And so we can say, well, uh, he's given uh, a set of trays and explications of those trays for uh, truths. Where's the imminence? And this is what he's going to take up in section two. Uh, the imminence of truths, imminence is in the title, it's important, and in fact, 
it's there from the beginning. All this talk about truths as being absolute, uh, eternal, um, universal, and what was the fourth one? And generic. That's a really important one that I have to develop a lot more. Anyhow, all this talk about uh, these trays of uh, truth, at the same time, tie the truth to imminence, because the imminence is being um, localized, produced, localized, um, related to by a subject within determinate worlds. So that's um, at least one of the senses of uh, imminence. Now, um, in section two of uh, the introduction called Imminence, Finitude and Infinite, uh, Bajiu is going to uh, go into the, similarly to the defining uh, traits of, um, of truths, is going to go into the defining or the characteristic traits of, um, of imminence. So, he starts off by saying that that's what he's going to do, and he announces um, the structure of this second section. He's going to define um, imminence uh, more clearly, and then he's going to examine an, a simple and astonishing ontological theorem which establishes an essential difference between the procedures of thought in the finite and those, or the, that is to say, those procedures that one can uh, install in the infinite. So I'm going to divide this in two. I'll talk about his uh, discussion of, um, of imminence and of uh, in the first part of section two and his discussion of finitude and then the theorem um, and the discussion of the theorem I'll do in another video. I won't go into, into all the uh, details of the mathematical proof of the theorem. The theorem is um, the fairly familiar and easy to understand and easy to find on the internet theorem that um, the number of subsets of a set is greater than the number of elements of that set. So if you don't know uh, that simple theorem, uh, I'll talk about it a little more in the next video and it's easy to look up and easy to understand. And if you're patient, if you just want to understand the ideas, uh, that you goes into the details of the two branches of the proof because one um, branch is the proof of the theorem in the finite case, in the case of finite sets, and the other branch is um, uh, a proof of a different structure for the f infinite case where you're dealing with infinite sets and it may seem surprising and counterintuitive that you can have um, infinite sets of um, greater uh, number or magnitude or power um, than um, uh, any given infinite set. So, but you explains that um, basically uh, God is in the details or the devil is in the details. Um, the detail in philosophy is at once the touchstone of a patience that can be required for the sorts of long detours um, that we find in Plato um, destined to making the making the case that any assertion um, must be argued for and 
submitting us to the considerable risk that during this long detour and this argumentation which is a whole path of thought and we can think of the paths of imminence that uh, we discussed in the introduction to a biography of Ordinary Man by Lowell, that uh, in this um, complicated path made of um, details, detours and arguments, um, the danger is that we might um, lose the essential aim, um, which is true life. So uh, Badiou has published a separate book um, called uh, True Life. So we're going to do arguments. We're going to do a lot of mathematics. That's the path he has chosen for this book. And perhaps the path he followed. Um, but the true aim is the true life, the good life, the happy life the philosophical life, the noetic life, and it's not knowledge, it's not expert knowledge, uh, or as, it, as in mastering mathematics or mastering as a, another science, or expert know-how as in mastering um, uh, artistic technique or political skills or even um, if that can exist, the relational skills um, necessary to um, modern day love or conjugality or whatever variants um, may arise. So he tells us that before coming to the chapters which are going to examine the modalities of finitude, its operations and uh, the figures of oppression that it organizes, and where the chapters, the same ones or later ones, um, lead us to the infinite sublation of all that, infinite sublation and replacement. Uh, Badiou wants to um, explain what what are the stakes? What is it all about when we use this title, The Imminence of Truths? So he says, um, my point of departure, which as usual uh, in philosophy is also the point that has to be demonstrated and legitimated, is on the one hand that there exist truths, existence with a, a universal value and scope that are recognizable as such by uh, any human subject, whatever, that can be recognized but uh, not necessarily always recognized or by everyone as um, this sort of existence that we call a truth. And on the other hand, so there are truths, they're, um, they're absolute, universal, um, eternal, generic, and um, whatever, um, objective. And the, the other side is that they're um, always inscribed in a determinate world and produced and inscribed and reinscribed in a determinate world. Um, so that's already radically revising, although from a postmodern point of view, maybe it would seem um, uh, evident. The truth is produced, but the non-evident part is truth is produced, but it's absolute, eternal, uh, generic, and um, universal. So we can produce things that we uh, have really produced. They're not just condemned to be 
produced and then discarded and produced and then discarded. Um, although, in fact, they are. That's the wrong attitude. That's a relativist attitude. But what we produce does have these qualities. And that's the surprising thing from a, a, a relativist point of view. Um, the universal truths are imminent um, in real worlds because they're created. So there's a tight um, link between um, truths and their, and their imminence because they're eternal forwards but not eternal backwards. They're produced. For contrary to Descartes, who uh, affirmed that truths were created by God, so that's an ontotheological uh, apparatus, uh, Badiou wants to tell us that truths are created by a human subject, whether personal or impersonal, whatever that means, whether individual or collective, that one's easy, truths are created by individual uh, researchers, militants, uh, lovers, or, or poets, or by um, collectives. We, and all, uh, this creation is done by um, human subjects within um, determined worlds and determined materials. So I've got to admit, I don't know what he means when he says they are created by a human subject, personal or impersonal. How can you be a human subject and be impersonal? Unless he's, he's sort of validating the um, idea not of ontological impersonality, but of a, um, a subjective impersonality that has been conquered by devoting oneself fully to um, a particular truth procedure. So it looks nice there, individual, collective, personal or impersonal, but um, I'm puzzled by um, this word, uh, this alternative of personal or impersonal when applied to a human subject. It's a question of a critical position. That's the one he's taking up. It's um, earlier he said it was um, a question of orientation, the generic orientation as opposed to the transcendent orientation of ontotheology or um, the um, relativist orientation or the constructivist orientation of democratic relativism. He says it's a question of critical position um, as a way of struggling against the skeptical or relativist position um, and the trans... Uh, well here he calls it the dogmatic position which affirms transcendent um, uh, uh, truths. So the critical position um, is a critical orientation and it's the same as the generic or orientation. Every transcendence and every uh, specificity that limits the um, infinity, the eternity, the uh, universality of, uh, of truths is to be um, dismantled. We affirm, so and thus it is not without um, a reason, without a good reason, or with, that this book has for its title, The Eminence of Truths, we affirm that truths are imminent in a triple sense. Okay, he's, he's done um, four uh, uh, 
characteristic traits for truths. Now he's going to do three characteristic traits for imminence. It's a pity you couldn't do four, don't you think? That would have made it really uh, neat and symmetrical. Anyhow, he's going to do three. But maybe he'll slip a fourth one in and won't even mention it. Anyhow, the first one is that truth is an imminent production in a determined world. In a uh, determined world in the sense of being historically and geographically uh, determined, localized in space and time. So imminence in that sense is the opposite of transcendence. It's produced and inscribed in determinate worlds. And at the, si at the same time, that's why you need, the book is not imminence or logic of imminence, it's imminence of truths, because within these imminent worlds or imminent to these worlds is the exception. The exceptions, these are um, truths. And they're exceptions because they're not limited by the constraints of uh, the worlds they arise in. They have universal value. And, well, maybe I'll comment on this a little more after his example. Um, but the idea basically is what we said last time, um, that mathematics is just one procedure, one example of where um, these eternal, universal, generic and um, absolute truths um, arise and can be related to uh, by a human subject that is faithful to them and is incorpor uh, incorporated or incorporates itself uh, within them. So we said, quoting the famous song, uh, love is all around us, um, politics is all around us, and in fact, um, despite the fact that uh, Badu is going to consider some fairly technical, I mean, I don't know what university level you would need to do to study that, especially as um, set theory has been um, de-emphasized. Um, over the last uh, decades, but it's a fairly technical um, mathematical uh, path through the book, but mathematics is everywhere too. And as we'll see from his example, um, the important thing is the um, subjective conversion, the paradigm um, uh, change that uh, the truth can operate within us. And that's an ongoing thing. You can't just learn mathematics and say, I know all about mathematics, so now I can talk about um, uh, Badger's philosophy, or I'm a, uh, a lifetime political militant, I know all about that, so I, um, in a, I'm in a privileged position to um, talk about Badger's philosophy and so on for art, and if anybody dares do it, um, claiming to be a, a master uh, of love, um, uh, all that would be the wrong approach. We're talking about truths as opposed to knowledge and know-how. So we're talking about truths as knowledge in the making, know-how in the making. We're talking about um, truths in processes of constitution and subjective incorporation in the world. So that's why um, I've read this book I, in French a couple of times. I've uh, worked on it. I produced a conference paper um, to describe the overall argument. And um, then I moved on to other things. I didn't keep on working and working and working it. I moved on to other things. 
So um, my subjectivity, my um, implication in different truth procedures has changed and my subjective incorporations have changed and so I'm coming back to the book and rethinking the book and when you come back to the book you're not just revising and say oh yeah I saw that before you're um, well at least that's what I'm trying to do rethinking the book and that should give me um, different results if you want but um, Badiou uh, reserves the word results for the waste products that circulate within uh, capital, capitalism as merchandisers, as merchandise. There, it should give different um, uh, works and truth effects in the works. So I'm creating a different work this time than I did the last time. So last times um, converged on um, a conference paper as a work and revisions and variations of that conference paper over perhaps a year. This time I'm creating a video book as part of a hyper book and a hyper reading. So um, the rethinking is uh, a reworking in the strong sense of working. So the example he's going to give is um, uh, pretty simple. It's um, the example of a theorem of geometry that you can find in Euclid's Elements. And um, he says it's undoubtedly the result of efforts of thought which uh, took place in the ancient Greek world. So. I mean, he doesn't specify, I think, a single theorem, but it's just, um, in fact, he's saying uh, basic school geometry. If you sort of uh, rethink that, you're already part participating in uh, the truth process. So um, what makes us human human subjects and not just human animals. Um, I don't know what he would say for geometry in other cultures and so on, but in a certain sense, uh, you could say arithmetic, maybe arithmetic. There has been some exper experiments showing that um, animals, including crows, uh, can count up to a certain number. Maybe animals can do um, additions and su subtractions. Sort of higher operations of arithmetic um, uh, will not be found um, in the animal kingdom, I suppose, uh, long division, unless you could find dolphins that could do long division. Um, because they've got big brains. But uh, once you get to a certain level of um, arithmetic even, you need, um, you need writing. So some form, in some form or other. Um, once you start getting into theorems and demonstrations, as in Euclid's elements, you're not going to find that in the uh, animal kingdom. So the fact of um, producing these theorems and um, uh, exposing human animals as children to them um, and having them think through the pro proofs, at least to a certain extent, that's already um, the constitution of these individuals as human subjects uh, inside incorporating themselves in the truth procedure of mathematics. And one could say a similar thing about um, the other truth procedures. Other examples would need to be found. But um, this is a fairly basic, a fairly simple example. So it's universal. It can be found in different worlds or understood. It's accessible to be understood in different worlds as um, 
uh, Basque or, or Chinese worlds, um, even if it um, was produced in a singular um, determined world, um, it has an absolute value which is not reducible to the particular Greek conditions of its production. So it's accessible, it can be uh, reproduced, understood and reworked because um, a, a truth is not the same thing as knowledge. It is reworked in some way, it's leaving it pretty open, um, it's adapted, re, uh, reworked, adjusted, maybe even transformed a little. Um, modern um, uh, abstract geometry is not um, it's not the same, even when it uh, as Greek um, ancient Greek geometry, even when it busies itself with reproducing uh, Euclid's theorems, for example. So it's not reducible to the particular conditions. This uh, thing of not being reducible, which we see from the beginning, with this idea of truths arising in determinate worlds but not reducible to them. That is a, a constant theme of, uh, of this book and of the other books by Badiou. Um, that's the danger of reductionism. And he has a pretty um, robust conception of uh, reductionism such that um, people who may not consider themselves to be reductionist will be um, uh, qualifiable as reductionist um, within Badiou's perspective if there's this reduction of um, universality or eternity or genericity or absoluity to the determinate conditions of production. So he tells us that the modern philosophical effort is precisely to separate this absolute value from all transcendence. So we have to get to the level of seeing the absoluteness of truths without falling into the trap of transcendence. We've got to be um, in a totally um, uh, layer-sized or secularized conception of uh, absoluteness. So we have to um, uh, draw unflinchingly all the possible consequences from the death of God. That is to say, we have to de-absolutize as much as possible without sacrificing um, the existence of truths or their absoluteness. So um, on the other side, you have to avoid the relativist trap. Given that, we can assume um, that one can no longer refer to divine transcendence to guarantee truths. So divine transcendence in all possible versions, even if we put the human in the places of the divine, or if we put method with the capital M or science with the capital S in place of the divine, what we have to go through is the crisis of foundations. And um, once again, there are two positions. The relativist one that is dominant today, that there are no truths, and the second, which says that the unique continuation of philosophy that Badiou knows of proposes a concept of truths such that their relation to the absolute um, 
does not depend on any reference to the one or to um, transcendence. So that gives us the second sense of imminence. The first one, remember, was the first sense of imminence was um, truths are produced in a determinate world, but they are exceptions to that world. The second sense is truths are in an imminent relation to the absolute signification of their own value. What does that mean? That means, at the least, that, um, I hate to use the word essence, but that's the uh, imminent relation there. Truths are not just by chance, contingently, absolute, eternal, uh, generic and universal. Um, they are by essence imminently and not imposed from the outside by a god that could transmit um, uh, absoluteness to whatever he chose truths are imminently endowed with an absolute um, signification and this absolute imminence is the point of departure for um, Badiou's uh, goal to show that um, the sign of this imminence of the absolute is given by the infinite value of a truth. So um, the basic idea is the imminence of truths and that they're um, Absoluteness is uh, an intrinsic property or an imminent property. And at the same time, to make clear, um, to clarify this particular concept of um, imminence, this absolute value is given by um, the infinite value. So we're going from absolute to infinite to the mathematical theories of, of, of infinite. A truth is always the witness of the possibility of a, an imminent relation between the finite and the infinite. So he brings up the word uh, uh, witness again. And I think even if he's not thinking directly of Lyotard, that um, that's um, material for a critique of Lyotard. Lyotard, um, Lyotard's différent is too different. Um, there's no relation. It's incommensurable in the sense of um, a hyper incommensurable infinite distance between uh, uh, the relative plane or the plane of relativity or relativism and um, the um, infinite authority of the prescription. And um, that creates conceptual problems that becomes uh, almost uh, terrifying in the distance that is um, set up between, it's an abyss, between the prescription and its infinity and the relative plane and its um, finitude. So um, Badger wants to avoid this sort of abyssal distance and he wants um, to uh, make clear that the truth, because of its imminence, is um, the witness of at least the possibility, because it doesn't impose, it's not a constraint like the constraint of finitude, it's the witness of a possibility of an imminent relation between the finite and the infinite. Otherwise, um, 
the world falls apart. Okay, in the third sense of the word imminence comes from the becoming subject of an individual or of a collective depending on its capacity to be imminent to a process of truth. Being a subject, becoming a subject, is itself a form of uh, imminence and it's the imminence uh, to a process of truth and so also to a relation to the absolute that is sustained by all truth. So we've got um, imminence as production within a determinate world. We've got um, imminence as um, this imminent relation between truths and their absolute value. And now we've got imminence as this imminence of the subject, which is the way a human animal um, becomes subject, to a process of truth. So I, I just want to comment on, on this third subjective one, because all this is said, all very um, sublimated and refined and uh, abstractly. Um, and we can say, yes, yes, that makes sense. But um, one could ask, what does it feel to become, uh, what does it feel like to become the subject of a truth process? And here, I think the best book to describe that sort of process is uh, Anti-Oedipus and the Schizo process, which is not really about uh, schizophrenics and um, is about this incorporation in generic processes of exception, which tear you away from the, the knowledge, the established practices uh, and constraints of the finite world and um, uh, spin you around um, within uh, a world of um, infinities and infinite capacities which could crush you or could um, uh, inflate you to uh, an identification with the process itself. That's um, the basic set of traps that Anti-Oedipus explores. And um, just to give you an example of that from later on in the book, um, Badiou in several places comments on the mathematical truth procedure. Well, I'm going to read you one passage, but uh, all over the place in his other works, Badiou comments on the um, truth effects, the truth work within the mathematical pr procedure and the dangers of um, going crazy that are inherent to that um, particular work. He tells us that um, the mathematical secularization operated by Cantor, the, layer, the mathematical layerization of the infinite, implies a separation of the infinite from the one. There, uh, um, the, the fact that there are um, infinites totally different amongst themselves is undoubtedly the most fundamental dis of discoveries of this secularization. That's the discovery of um, uh, Cantor, that there are many um, infinites, not just one. Um, it is all the more remarkable that this new thought uh, has not only kept, but also um, 
rationalized and clarified the four modes of access to the notion. That's something he describes um, uh, in the middle of the book. Um, one will not be astonished then in these conditions at the fact that Cantor, it is true, mentally uh, disturbed by his own genius and by the radicality of his conceptual inventions. It's not a, a, a astonishing that Cantor asked Rome, asked the Pope, if his mathematical concept of the infinite was a blasphemy or not. Badiou continues, I think, uh, in effect, uh, that it is blasphemous, since staying um, uh, estranged from the one, uh, the diverse forms of the multiple infinity cannot be um, figured as uh, persons, not even analogically. So that's a case where somebody um, has um, participated in a breakthrough in um, a truth procedure, in this case mathematics, and um, by the very fact that this breakthrough requires subjective relations and subjective incorporation has um, undergone mental derangement and uh, delirium, in fact. So that's a parallel that I've never seen anyone make, but I, uh, I think it's important that um, this seemingly um, dry and abstract uh, book, when you consider the um, subjective inscriptions and incorporations that it presupposes and describes sort of um, with uh, refinement and distance, are the sorts of things that we find um, in Anti-Oedipus if we take the book as being a description of uh, noesis, if we take the book Anti-Oedipus as the logical, in the strong sense of logical successor of um, uh, logic of sense. So, Section two, or part two of section two of the introduction is on the word finitude. So, Badiou starts off with the present day after um, the death of God and the uh, liberation that that produces and says that um, a strict doctrine of finitude has been deployed in the West, um, which is going to consider the human being as reducible to finite parameters. So here's once again that word, uh, reducible, that there is um, uh, inherent reductionism going on uh, in a contemporary Western society, and this reductionism is in terms of parameters, finite parameters. And ultimately, uh, that word of parameters uh, is going to take on its technical sense of parameters of calculation. So the most um, usual, usual um, argument that you tells us is that the human animal is mortal. So we're finite because we die, we're mortal. And uh, he says that um, he's going to come back um, on that argument later on. And 
it's the oldest of what he calls the operators of finitude. So he's going to have a whole chapter on the operators of finitude, the operators that ma ma maintain us within the space of finitude, so that we can't even imagine um, or take seriously anything else. And he says, but there are lots of other operators. And another one is the, the idea that uh, everything that is created by man or by humans is created in the context of a particular culture. And so is only understandable if we uh, master the parameters, notably linguistic, of this culture. Cultural relativism. I would place that um, even more strongly and apply it to reading the current book. That will be, once again, and I apologize for insisting on the danger of mathematical reductionism, that will be um, uh, the danger of one particular reading of the book, saying that you have to um, understand this book, that this book is only understandable, that the concepts of this book are only understandable um, within the um, cognitive parameters that it uh, sets out, mainly mathematical ones, that is already a form of uh, cultural relativism in the way that um, Badiou defines it. So where to read this book, but not, I mean, there are cognitive parameters that we have to master but we're not to limit our understanding to the actual uh, cognitive uh, parameters that are um, uh, set up within the book. We can understand the concepts in totally different terms, and that's what we have to do. Otherwise, we're not in truth in the making and truth effects, we're in knowledge effects, which are the effects of finitude and um, uh, relativism. One can teach uh, the necessarily incomplete character of access to truth, truths being the object of uh, an infinite research, which, because they're, it's infinite, can never um, come to an end. And so all the, the best that we could do is acquire a capacity to doubt everything that is presented as true. So truths are infinite, but that's bad because if you envision truths as infinite, I mean, that's bad from the point of view of the finite, finitist ideology. Um, we can never come to uh, an absolute conclusion. And so we must abandon the idea of truth as infinite, as essentially flawed. And we must go back um, to the better concept, the more manageable, more calculable concept of um, uh, permanent doubt. Badiou goes on to say that even a rigid application of Marxism can lead to the same result of relativism um, and doubt about the rest. Uh, this, um, given that Marxism uh, relativizes ideology to uh, class membership, and given that Marxism has trouble of deciding on which class is the universal class, um, that's going to lead to, I mean, it's not Marxism itself, it's a um, result of the Marxist perspective once you take out the um, supposedly 
uh, over naive uh, element of the proletariat as uh, classically conceived being the universal class. And once you do that, you're stuck in um, uh, the absence of a universal class. So um, a class relativism. And um, that just um, is a sort of new layer that superimposes itself in um, Badger's term on historical and cultural relativism. So that reinforces the relativism instead of um, allowing us to escape it. If we want to escape from such a world in which there are only relative creations, um, one must proceed to a minutious criticism or critique of the thesis of finitude. One must show that the infinite is a resource that is um, something that can be required, that we can insist on and demand, and that is real, um, as a guarantee concerning um, the universal values of truth. He tells us that he's going to uh, try and show that this infinite resource of truths uh, infiltrates itself everywhere um, within the most simple as well as the most abstract thoughts. So here again, he's saying, I think, that um, this infinite resource is available to everybody. It's available in um, abstract, the most abstract thought, including the most abstract thought in mathematics of um, the higher and higher levels of infinity. And it's available in the most simple of thoughts. The example he, he gave before was just any, uh, pick a theorem, any theorem from Euclid's elements even the simplest one, and um, uh, the infinite resource is uh, present there if you uh, reactivate the thought and don't just take it um, on, on faith as um, a teaching rather than something that you have to go through, um, reenact the, the proof and so on. So now he's setting up the next section, which I'll deal with in the, in the next video. I'm going to propose an exercise here, show that the same property in the finite on the one hand, no, demonstrate the same property in the finite on the one hand and in the infinite on the other. So he's going to demonstrate the same property uh, in two different ways. One that's adapted to the finite and one that's adapted to the infinite. So by that means he's going to uh, verify that the demonstration of the infinite case is radically different from the demonstration of the finite case. So the demonstration of the finite case is where sort of um, going on uh, a fairly sort of um, uh, straight road like a highway um, everything is nice and smooth and um, uh, with arrows uh, showing the direction and so on um, and in the infinite case it's um, a more tricky path that we have to follow so he says we are going to as i often do turn around a fundamental example taken from mathematics. But, as the reader is going to see, the signification of this demonstration as to the difference of rationality between reason limited to the finite and reason that takes the risk of the infinite, this 
signification, its general signification, is not at all limited to mathematics. So we have to uh, have this double thought all the times. Yes, he's giving um, uh, an extensive treatment of mathematics, and it's essential, and we have to go through it and understand as much as we can, at least make the effort. And at the same time, we have to think that this is just an example, the best one he can come up with, um, and the clearest um, uh, to take us through his conceptual creation, but that other examples of a ra radically different sort are um, possible and acceptable and even desirable. <laughs>